Good evening. This is Wednesday, November the 4th, 2020. Uh, time's running out for 2020 and we'll be into 2021 pretty soon and hopefully a different year and a better year. <clears throat> Trust this finds you well and uh, that you'll uh, be blessed by the Bible study tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking out of Deuteronomy 31 and 32, mostly chapter 32. And I'm going to ask a question for my title. Who is your rock? You remember uh, several years back, there was a commercial by an insurance company, I think it's Prudential, that said you can own a piece of the rock. I don't want a piece of the rock. I want the rock. And uh, the question is, who is your rock? Now, now listen to Deuteronomy 31, verse 30. And Moses spoke in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. So this is a song from Moses about what's going on with them. Now, in uh, verse uh, 32, chapter 32, verse 1, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain my speech shall be de distilled as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all of his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. He is the rock. Now, look down in uh, verse 18 of the same chapter. He said, Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Of the rock that you are, you've forgotten him. You've forgotten your rock. Now, down in verse uh, 31, he said, For their rock is not our rock. That is, the, the pagan people, their rock's not even our, even our enemies themselves being judges, that is, they recognize or realize this. And verse 37, and he shall say, where are their gods, their rock, in whom they trusted? Talking about the enemies of God. Now, Moses, the great leader of Israel, is about to leave this world. He's about to check out. He's about to go on to be with God. And he speaks these final words to Israel concerning the greatness of God in the form of a song. And he says, concerning the enemies of God's people, their rock is not our rock. In other words, we don't depend upon the same things. We're not rooted on the same principles. Their gods are not our God. Uh, that's what verse 37 said. Their gods are not our gods. Uh, their foundation is not our foundation. Uh, Israel had forgotten the true rock and uh, had turned to a unstable rock. Now, if you read verses 5 through 18, and I'm not going to try to read all those right now, you'll find that charge against them. So rock denotes safety and stability. Uh, the wise man built his house upon the rock, stability. The foolish man built his house upon the sand, unstable. When the rains came, it washed the foundation away with the sand and the house crumbled. The one upon the rock stood, the winds, the rains, the floods. And and God hid Moses in the cleft of the rock for his protection when he passed by. A rock is a place of protection, safety, and stability. And the world looks uh, to the rock of religion, the rock of philosophy, the rock of riches, and finds they're not stable, but shifting sands. You think about it, the rock of religion. If you just have religion, it changes with whoever's in charge of your religion. If you have philosophy, it changes who wrote the latest books. If you have riches, it depends on how valuable what you have is anymore. What you have can be devalued today. And they're very unstable to rocks. Jesus is the rock that never changes. You remember what Jesus said when he was talking about his church? He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. What rock? That he's Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. That's a confession Peter made. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, upon that rock, the foundation that I am God in human form, I build my church. The rock that followed them, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, when they was in the wilderness wondering, the rock that followed them was Christ, the rock. Now, who is your rock? 
Our rock is superior to the rock of the world. Why? Because he's our father. Look at verse 8. When Moses, or the Mo, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, and when he separated the sons of Abram, or of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. When God the Most High divided as the father the inheritance to the sons of Adam. You see that? He, he acted as a father. He gave the people their inheritance. But verse six prior to that said, do you thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that had brought thee and had made thee and, and, and sta he that, and hath he not made thee and established thee? Is not God the, your father? And he illustrates it in verse 8 when he says, the Most High gives you your inheritance. Where does your inheritance come from? The Father divided it with his children in those days. But he's our Father, and he said, you're the apple of my eye, verse 10. You ever heard that, that uh, phrase? He found him in the desert land and the waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Now, what does that mean? The pupil, the vital part. He finds you as the pupil of his eye. He sees you as very important and special. And then he, he, he said, uh, he's like an eagle hovering over a nest, verse 11. And as the eagle stirs up her nest, flutters over her young, and spreads out her wings, and taketh them, and beareth them on her wings. As an eagle flutters over her nest, stirs up her nest, really tears it up, and takes the little eagles on her wings and takes them out to teach them to fly. An eagle flutters over her young in order to drive them out of their nest. The, I've read that that word fluttered over means they just basically destroy the nest, the place of safety the little ones have had up to now. Well, you know, God permitted troubles in Egypt to get his people to leave and become a nation. He hovered over them as like an eagle over the nest and fluttereth above it. He stirred things up. He wrecked a good thing. I mean, that, as long as Joseph was alive, they really had it good. But when Joseph died and he wasn't recognized by the Pharaoh that came on the scene, it wasn't so good. God was tearing up the nest. If he hadn't have done that, the people would never want to leave and go back to the promised land. As an eagle broods over her young to keep them warm, God, by his Holy Spirit, is hovering over Israel. You see, that old mother eagle would hover over those young ones in the nest to keep them warm. Well, God hovers over Israel now with his spirit. And he said the eagle spread out her wings and to bear her young upon them, teaching them to fly. The Lord bore Israel in leading her out of Egypt. You see, we sometimes miss the illustrations here. That eagle spreads out her wings, and those little eagles on her wings, and she takes them out, and they one by one begin to fall off and fly. Well, God has to take us out to where we've got no choice. It's like the sink or swim, you know. Though you're in the lake, you sink or you swim. Well, you get it, the eagle gets them up in the air. You fly or you die. Well, God said to Israel, I'm leading you out of Egypt like a mother eagle taking her little ones on her wing. Now, our God is superior to all others. He, he's our father, but he's also because he has the nature of the rock. He's immutable, that is, unchangeable. That's what Hebrews 13, 8 says. Our rock is unchangeable. Do you know many things in the world that doesn't change? Man, in my lifetime, in your lifetime, how many things have you seen change? But God hadn't changed. Religions of the world change. How many, how many changes have you seen in the religions of the world? Those that have their, their written documents and they, they change it later and say, well, this is what we believe now. Jesus never changes. He's a rock. I read one time of an infidel who had a daughter and she was dying and she looked up at her father who had taught her, there's no God, you don't have to worry about the afterlife. But the mother was a godly woman who believed in God and she looked up at her infidel father and said, Father, now that I'm dying, who do I believe, you or mother? See, the old infidel had something good to live with, but when it comes to dying, he has no comfort. The philosophies of the world change. The philosophies may be good to live by right now, but they won't stand the test of time and they won't stand the test of eternity. He's our father. 
He's our rock. He is ever present. God said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. No, never, no, never, no, never, no, never is what that Hebrews 13 passage means. I will never, ever, 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 ever leave you or forsake you. So he's our father. And uh, he, he, he's superior. He's a superior rock, not only because our father and he has the nature of a rock, but because of the benefits derived or derived from the rock. Look, look in verse 18. He says, life is one of those benefits of the rock that begat thee. Begat means to give life. Of the rock that begat thee art unmindful. Are you unmindful and has you forgotten the God that formed you? Have you forgotten the God that formed you? Have you forgotten the God that begot you, that brought you into this world? You see, they gave you life. Other religions just convert to a system. Christianity is being born again. First John says, he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God becomes a child of God. He's born anew. He's born again. He's life. We get life physical. We get life eternal through our rock. He's our Savior. Deuteronomy 13, 15 said, But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. He lightly esteemed the rock of his deliverance, of his salvation. Their rock is treacherous. Their rock is not to be trusted. Their rock is treacherous sands, shifting sands, false hopes uh, of, of their own imaginations. Our rock is solid, stable, and never shifts. You don't need a piece of the rock. You need the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, who never changes. He's life, he's Savior, and he has the supply. Deuteronomy 32, 13. He made him to ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. He's out of supply. He said, you got honey out of the rock. That means our supply never runs dry. Oil out of the flint. It never runs dry. He has an everlasting supply. You remember the message uh, I don't know if it was last week or week before about, about the Elijah and the widow who had just enough oil and, and flour to bake one, one uh, cake for a meal and then die. But when she fed the prophet and did what God told her, the oil never ran dry. Well, my friend, I want to tell you, the supply never runs dry with God. He can bring honey out of a rock. He can bring water out of a rock. He can bring manna down from heaven. Our supply never runs dry with him. The earth runs dry. The Lord doesn't. And <clears throat> not only that, but he's, he, he's a rock because of his perfect works. It's, uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. His work is perfect. Never, never falters. Never cracks. Never fails. You see, the rocks of this world crack. You know, I, I, I had a, the opportunity a few years back to, to go to Plymouth uh, uh, Rock and, and see that famous rock. <laughs> it was a disappointment. I looked down in a hole in a cage and there was this rock and it had a crack in it. My friend, you look at Jesus and there's no crack. His works are perfect and he start, whatever he starts, he finishes. God's able to bring it to pass and will. He'll never stop. Whatever God starts, he finishes. And he started a work in us, a work of salvation. And he'll not quit till it's finished. If God's begun a good work in you, he'll complete it in the day of Jesus Christ when he comes. And the Bible says we are hid with him. He takes care of us. He protects us. His works are perfect. He hides us. We're hid in Christ, with Christ in God. A double barrier between us and the devil. And we live our lives because he lives. Because I live, you shall live also, Jesus said. He's alive and we live. And we have eternal possessions. The benefits 
eternal possession. We have an eternal home in heaven. I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you where I am. There you may be also. We have an inheritance to inheritance, incorruptible, un undefiled, reserved in heaven for us, Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 4. For us who are kept by the power of God, we're in God's hand with eternal possessions that will never be taken away. How many of you got possessions now that can't be taken away on this earth? You got money in the bank? Somebody can steal it. You got money in the stock market? It can crash. You got possessions in your home? It can be destroyed by winds, by floods, by rain, by lightning, whatever. Thieves can steal it. Those possessions are not eternal. Nothing we have here that's tied to this earth is eternal. So we, we have these benefits from our superior one. He's our father. He's our rock. We derive all benefits from the rock that we need. And he's the judge. Look at verse 36. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he sees <clears throat> that their power is gone. There is none shut up or left. The Lord shall judge. Folks, it's not up to other people to judge us. The Lord is our judge. Our rock is superior to their rock. Never doubt it. But their rock is inferior to our rock. Our rock is superior. Theirs is inferior. Listen, uh, th there's no lasting satisfaction. Look, look at uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 31, the last part. He said, even our enemies themselves, and the King James says being judges, which means even our enemies recognize and realize that their rock's not our rock and is not equal. Why can't we see that? Because their rock gives no hope for the future. Future, the infidel, the atheist, they have no hope for the future. Everything's tied to now. When this is over, it's all over, they say. Don't settle for any old rock. Don't settle for a piece of a rock, but flee to the rock. Christ Jesus, find footing on him. You may slip around on the rock, but you won't fall off the rock. He's stable. He's there. You're fastened to him. I, I hope somehow or another, you, you see the importance of this, and you'll go back and read the Song of Moses in, in uh, Deuteronomy 32 and, and get the parts we didn't read and, and look at how, how good God's been to us and given us a rock. Remember that old eagle over the nest? That's God. Sometimes he stirs up our nest to get our attention, to teach us to soar on our own. Let's, let's just be mindful of God's goodness and God's blessings in these days. Let me pray with you before we sign off. Our Father, thank you for the love of Jesus and the power of God that we experience in our lives. Thank you for that rock that's stable. It can't be moved by the things of this world, and it's eternal. It never falters. It never fails. Lord Jesus is, is our rock of stability in this world and the world to come. And may we depend upon him fully. I pray for it's anyone listening that doesn't know Jesus as Savior right now. Something will prick their heart to let them know they need to be saved. They need Jesus. And they'll turn to him today. Lord, we just ask this in your name, giving you the honor and the glory for all you've done and will do in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you until the next time.